There are three sliders in Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom that I feel are potentially destroying photos. Now, before I get into what those three sliders are, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory about where this comes from. On my site, f64elite.com, I help the subscribers there make their images better through critique sessions, which are more like problem solving sessions. And in those sessions, I accept 24 images per month. And of those 24 images per month, I record five to seven minutes of video per image to help individuals make those photos better. I get submissions from all different levels of photographers, from beginners to advanced, to even pros. I also get submissions from various different cameras. So I've been checking the EXIF data as these files come in that have me scratching my head sometimes, and I'll see something like an EOS R5 or a Nikon you know, Z6 II or a Sony A7 R4, uh, some monster cameras that produce some amazing RAW files, but the images I look at are like, whoa, why did they, what happened here? I had some thoughts on what could be causing this, so I pulled the F64 Elite members in the F64 Academy Facebook page, and I found that a lot of people are using these sliders. So what are those three sliders? Well, those three sliders are dehaze, texture, and clarity. So I'm gonna show you what not to do, and then I'm gonna give you two alternatives. One alternative will be here in Adobe Camera Raw, and another alternative will be inside of Photoshop. So let's begin. What we have here in the effects area are texture, clarity, and dehaze. Now these, remember, these used to be up here underneath the color sliders, when the color sliders were all in the basic settings in Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom. Now these effects are right here, and I very rarely use them, if ever use them, to the point that I could probably even get them completely off of here and never really see them again. And I'll show you why. I'm just gonna press auto on this image just to open up the dynamic range a little bit in this photo so we can see things a little bit better. Now, many might look at this composition and say, this is crap, there's too much sky. And, uh, well, okay, that's cool. I like it because of the vastness of that sky with those big puffy white clouds. This would make a phenomenal black and white image, but it also shows a scale and size compared to these large mountains that are down below. Composition aside, let's say we want those clouds, which are the subject here, to be a little bit more dynamic. We want some more oomph, some more passion in those things. Well, if we go to the light section here, we might be able to incorporate that with a little bit more contrast you would think, but it's just not working. But if we move the exposure down, look at how much drama could be in those clouds. So some of us might be inclined to move down here to the effects slider because we know of one slider that can really force that drama and also bring in a little bit of blue in the process and that's dehaze. And look what happens as I move this up here. And you might be thinking, there's no way someone would do this, but th this happens. I see it all the time in submissions. And I think it's just a lack of education about what's happening here. As we move this dehaze up, yes, we get that dramatic, punchy sky, but it comes with a lot of excess contrast and some really deep blues that are so saturated, they're just basically absorbing all of the life of whatever color could be in the rest of the image. So then we might be inclined to drop this dehaze a little bit and maybe blend it in and get the best of both worlds. Well, I would say that that's not a bad idea, but look what happens here to our foreground. If I press Alt or Option and turn this off completely, our foreground does not need that much blue. Okay, let me talk about texture and clarity now. We'll get, it, we'll get back to this in a second. We'll move this texture up and some might move this up because again, they want more drama in that sky or maybe even more detail in the foreground. And then they might couple that with clarity because wow, we're getting a lot of that down there now, aren't we? But what's happening is this is a really harsh and sharp micro contrast that is doing more harm than good because when the brain sees this, it's almost like, oh man, I don't know about you, but have you ever stuck your tongue on a nine volt battery before? It gives you like a zing. Well, when I see an image that looks like this, I get that same zing that I would feel if I put a nine volt battery on my tongue. Don't try that at home. Here's the deal. This is just too much. And one of the things that is too much about this is it's happening globally. So instead of reaching for these sliders that I was talking to my friend Gavin Hardcastle of Photo Tripper. He coined them the unholy trinity. Now, speaking of my friend Gavin Hardcastle, him and I are working on a course called Make Great Shots. We're intending on releasing this at the end of March 2025. But before we get to that point, him and I have this friendly competition going on. Our course is 100% collaborative, and because of the nature of this course, we are forced to work together amicably. So 
because it's Gavin and I, we have to have some form of competition. So if you could do me a favor and click on the link in the description below and vote for whichever image you feel is the strongest. It's a completely blind vote. You won't know whose is Gavin's or whose is mine. We realize that this is completely just for us and our little tiny egos. But while you're there, you can sign up with your email so that you can be the first to be informed when our course is released. We've been working very hard on this content. And I have to say, it's been shaping up to be a very unique course. So click on that link in the description, give us a vote, and I'm really hoping you picked the right one. So let's avoid the unholy trinity if we're gonna use them globally. I'll just reset this. The better bet would be to come over here into the masking section, and while you're in the masking section, make a sky mask, and we're gonna separate our foreground from our background. Once we have that, we can just duplicate this and invert it, and that'll give us our foreground selection and our sky selection. So with this mask number one, this is our sky. I know that because it's white and the mask is white and it's showing us in red. I'll take this dehaze and I'll just put it up a little bit. Now, one of the reasons why I really like using this at a local level, meaning just for the sky rather than globally, is that even if I bring this up high, I've got two things that I can do. I can counterbalance the amount of blue that comes across with that dehaze by just increasing my color slider to the more yellow version, or I could even come in here and kind of nullify some of that contrast, maybe increase or decrease my highlights along with it, and maybe even give that a little bit of an exposure bump so that I kind of get the best of both worlds. If I turn this eyeball off, we get that contrast, but I can use these sliders to counterbalance the negative effects that I'm getting from that oomph that we normally see from the dehaze slider. What I could also do here is I could reduce the amount. If I reduce the amount, after I get these settings dialed in, I can get it exactly where I want it to be, which gives us a whole new level of control over dehaze than to do it globally. In my personal opinion, dehaze should never be used globally. Now we'll go up to this mask here and I'll talk about the same concept, but with texture and clarity. So if I zoom in here, I'll just grab my magnifying glass and zoom in. If I increase my texture, that's pretty nice. It gives me a, a, a good little boost. And so does my clarity. It gives me a little boost in some of the detail that's down there in that foreground. But again, it's very strong. So I can counterbalance that by bringing down the contrast a little bit or even bring up the contrast a little bit to get some of that back. I could look at the exposure settings. I could even possibly look at the highlights, okay? Or even the shadows here and get some of that back from the negative effects of what's happening with clarity. I also have the ability to drop my amount so that it's not so much. So I can effectively use those sliders in a very healthy way that doesn't destroy my image, but actually does help it. Now, this is a little excessive. I'd probably bring a lot of this stuff down because I like to do a slow buildup process. But if you're staying in Adobe Camera Raw and Adobe Camera Raw only, or Lightroom for that matter, this would be the way that I would control that. Now let's hop into Photoshop and I'll show you how I make similar effects with unprecedented and almost unlimited control over those effects. Okay, so here we are inside of Photoshop and we don't have a texture slider, we don't have a clarity slider, and we do not have a dehaze slider, but we have all the elements to create all of that stuff inside of Photoshop. Let's first start with dehaze. So what I'm gonna do here is very similar to what I did inside of Adobe Camera Raw, and that was to make a sky selection. So I'm gonna go up to select and go to sky. And all I have to do now is turn on an adjustment layer. For this, I'm gonna use curves. Curves is essentially like three-dimensional way to modify your tones. If you look down here, this is actually what levels are. If we just move this over, we're making things more black or we're making things more white. Those are basically what you would have control of for levels. Now, what you don't have for levels is that little middle slider that's your midtones. That's what this is. So we can completely shape the way our shadow or dark areas look, our midtone areas in this area, and our highlight areas in this area. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go ahead and make this a little bit darker and pull that down. Okay, that's starting to look pretty wonderful. And then pull this up to pull up some of that midtone value, and then maybe even pull this down a little bit to bring some drama in those clouds. Now, while this is not necessarily dehaze, does it not look very similar to what we would get from dehaze? I do believe it does, but we have a whole lot of options here because inside of Photoshop, once we make an adjustment like this, we can change the blend mode, we can change the opacity, we can use blend if, we can do all kinds of things to this image so that 
this dehaze that we're trying to do goes exactly where we want it to go. So once I've got that curve set up, I can drop the opacity here so it's not quite as strong. This basically becomes my amount slider that you would have seen in the masking section. And we have a very similar version of dehaze right here inside of Photoshop. And the more you want take this down, the darker and stronger that's gonna get, the more dehaze-like it gets. This is definitely something you use with a soft hand, not necessarily with the heavy hand. Couple that with the fact that we have blend if. I can double click inside this curves adjustment layer here. And if I don't want this curve to affect the highlight areas drama, I can pull it this way. And we only put that drama after we press alt or option to feather it into the midtone and shadow areas. Or maybe I don't want it to affect the midtone and shadow areas, but I want that to be in those highlight areas. I can bring it up here and then alt or option feather that over. This gives us much more unique control than even dehaze inside of a mask in Lightroom. And one could argue, well, you could use a luminosity mask inside of Lightroom, and that's, in, that's entirely true. However, those masks are not nearly as good as the masking that is inside of Photoshop, in my personal opinion. So that would be our dehaze curve. Okay, so we can just call this dehaze. Now let's talk about texture and clarity. And while we do not have a texture and clarity slider in here, we barely even have good sharpening inside of Photoshop. There is one technique that a lot of people use to sharpen, and that's called a high pass sharpen. Those who are familiar with this will know exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna use it in a really unique way that kind of gives us that micro contrast level of control rather than the sharpness. Sharpness is like super contrast control, the very nitpicky microscopic contrast that you see in your image. The next level up would be that mid-level contrast that we're going to target, very similar to how texture and clarity do. So I'm going to zoom into this area here because this is the area that we want it. And you're going to see that I'm going to have much more control over this also. First thing I'm going to do is duplicate this by pressing Command or Control J. And then I need to change this to the linear light blend mode. Now, most people do this with the soft light blend mode or sometimes even overlay, but I use linear light or even sometimes vivid light for this because this is where you're going to get that micro contrast effect rather than the sharpening effect that you would get from something like soft light or overlay. Now, if we use linear light or vivid light, we need to know that fill is what controls that. So what I'm going to do right off the bat, because I don't like how it's affecting the sky, I want to see this in a different way. I'm going to press alt or option on this mask right here, drag it down to this one to borrow it and then press Command or Control I to invert it. That way, we basically have the exact same thing that we had inside of Adobe Camera Raw when we inverted that mask. So here's where the magic happens. I'm gonna go to Filter, Other, and then High Pass, okay? Now, when I go to High Pass, the higher I make this high pass adjustment, the more of that micro contrast I get. And you can see when I bring it up here, it looks like you're just taking that clarity and texture slider and really hiking them up. So I usually take this somewhere to a, what I feel is my most comfortable max because I know I can always use fill to reduce it. So if I move this right about to about the 1.5 pixels, that's about good. Maybe even let's go three pixels because I'll show you how even if I take it to a level that's a little bit too far, all I have to do because this is the linear light blend mode, go to fill and drop this down. As I drop that down, you're going to start to see that it changes the algorithm of how this layer is going to affect the underlying layers. And I actually get a pretty nice micro contrast sharpness happening in my foreground area. As with all sharpening and even micro contrast adjustments, the one thing that I really don't like about texture and clarity inside of Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom is they tend to be very heavy handed and global. Now, when I'm doing any type of sharpening, I typically don't want that to affect my shadow areas. So what do I have here that can help me with that? Blend if. So if I double click on this and move this up a little bit, I wanna protect my underlying layers from being hit by this much texture and clarity. So I move this over and you start to see it go away from my dark areas, alt or option, I can feather that over and then into my midtones. So I get a really nice, highly effective micro contrast sharpness that mimics texture or clarity but it's not using texture or clarity. Now, I'm not saying that you should never use the unholy trinity of sliders, but I will say this, there are other options, and now you know those other options. And maybe, just maybe, this will help you from making that old school garish HDR look in your photos that you typically get by hiking up texture, dehaze, and clarity too far. 
I certainly hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I like to take difficult things in Photoshop and make them seemingly simple so you can use them in your workflow today.